What's up my precalc people? In this video, we're gonna talk about the very first free response question on the AP precalculus exam. Now, College Board has laid out an awesome framework for exactly what this question is gonna look like. And we're gonna talk about that framework and do a full example in this video. The full example we're gonna take a look at is from the course exam description, so hopefully your teacher's already shared it with you. And if not, well, you're gonna experience it right now. Now, the cool thing is this. I can promise you that when you open up the AP Precalculus exam in May and you get to that very first FRQ, well, it's not gonna look exactly like the problem in this video, but the framework of the question will look exactly the same. So the more you see problems like this, the more you practice problems like this that I offer you in the ultimate review packet for Precalculus, the better prepared you'll be. That way, when you do get to this question, you'll know exactly what to do. All right, let's take a look at it right now. So it's important to know that on the first FRQ, you are allowed to use a graphing calculator. Now the first FRQ is guaranteed to look something like this. It's gonna be dealing with function concepts. It's gonna present functions expressed graphically, numerically, analytically, or any combination of those three things. Now the question will include three parts, but unfortunately each part could have multiple parts to it. But there's three main parts and they're gonna require students to work with a variety of concepts. These concepts can include function composition, inverse functions, input output values, zeros of a function and behavior, identification of appropriate function type to construct a function model, amongst other things. So here's an example from the AP Precalculus course exam description of exactly what an FRQ number one is gonna look like. So here is the problem. They're given a function f shown in table form, and we are told that f is an increasing function defined from x is greater than zero or equal to zero. Now, what that means is that we're guaranteeing that it's increasing. So if we look at our output values, negative 10, negative 5, 4, 17, 34, they're increasing. But we don't know without the fact that they're telling us it's an increasing function that, you know, maybe they're going up and down, like maybe between three and four, you know, it drops down and then comes back up to 17. But we know that's not happening because it's specifically saying it's an increasing function. So throughout the entire function as x greater than or equal to zero, it's always going up. That's important to know, especially for a later question. Now, the table gives all the values that we see for f of x. Now, we're also given a second function g in analytical form, x cubed minus 14x minus 27 divided by x plus 2. Again, exactly what they said. You're going to be presented with different functions in a non-real world situation in table form, analytical form. Now, we don't see a graphical form here, but that could certainly come up on a different questions that are, you know, on a specific question number one on a different test. All right, so let's talk about part a. Because again, remember, there's three parts. So here, part a has two parts. They first define a new function h as the composition of g composed of f. So we're going to literally take f and plug it into g to create this new function h. And then they want us to find the value of h of 5 and to a decimal approximation. The second part of part a is to find the inverse of function f at 4. Okay, we could do that as well, but let's do it in pieces. So let's do, first do the first part of part a. All right, so again, nice and simple. We're going to take 5 and plug it in for x. That's what they're asking us to do. So following our rules for compositions of functions, we're going to start on the inside. We first can figure out what is f of 5. And to do that, we're going to go to our table because our table represents f. And we're going to look that with an input of 5, the output is 34. Nice. All right, now we have to figure out what is g of 34. So now we have to plug 34 into function g. So plugging 34 into function g, we get 34 cubed minus 14 times 34 minus 27, all divided by 34 plus 2. Now, again, you are allowed to use a calculator. So don't even waste your time trying to do all this math by hand. You're just wasting time. Utilize your calculator. The numerator is uh, 38,801. The denominator is 36. It did say a decimal approximation is okay. So divide them to get 1,077.806. But I want you to notice how nice I was showing all of my work from the very beginning to what they're asking me, showing all the steps. That's what they expect for a nice, perfect score on the AP exam. All right, part two wanted me to evaluate the inverse of f at four. Now, I have a table that's going to show me this. So all I'm going to be doing in my table is I'm looking for an output of four. Remember, inverses, the input is now the output. So f of x, we have input x output y but now we're switching that so now the input is my output and the output 
was my input. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you learned that. So I'm looking for where I see an output of four. That's right here. And what input creates that? Three. So the inverse of the function f at four is equal to three. Hopefully that's not too bad either. All right, moving on to part B. All right, so part B says, find all values of x as decimal approximations for which g of x equals three. Okay, that's not too bad. Then determine the end behavior of g as x decreases without bound, and they want me to express my answer in limit notation. Okay, so I'm definitely using function g, and let's do part one first. They want me to figure out all values, or indicate if there aren't any, for g of x equals three. All right, so I'm going to write that out, g of x equals 3, and g of x is x cubed minus 14x minus 27, all divided by x plus 2, and I'm going to set that equal to 3 to solve. Now, you might want to say, oh, I could do this by hand. I'm going to try to do this with algebra. That's awesome. That's great. You might actually be able to, but remember, you're allowed to use your calculator, so use that calculator as an advantage to make these problems faster. I'm going to go right to my y equals on my T84 calculator. I'm going to enter in both sides of the equation. For y1, I'm going to enter in g of x, x cubed minus 14x minus 27 divided by x plus 2. For y2, I'm going to enter 3. Then I'm going to simply hit zoom 6, which is my standard zoom, to get a graph. And I see the two functions in red and blue. And the intersection is where I'm looking for. So hopefully you know how to use the intersection command. You're going to hit second trace, select intersect. You're going to select each curve one at a time and then guess at the intersection point. And we see that intersection point is at an x value of 4.875, which creates a value of 3. Nice and simple. So there's my answer, 4.875. The second part wanted me to describe the end behavior of g as x decreases without bound using my limit notation. So first, let's make sure we understand limit notation. So we're going to say the limit of g of x as x decreases without bounds, that's going towards negative infinity. What's happening here? Well, how do I figure this out? Well, when working with rational functions, what we want to do is divide the leading terms. So I'm going to divide the leading terms, x cubed divided by x. Now, when I divide those leading terms, I get x squared. Now, the result is a polynomial. If the result of the division of your leading terms is a polynomial, the end behavior of that polynomial is the end behavior of your overall rational function. And finding the end behavior of a polynomial is really, really easy. I have an even degree. That means that both ends are doing the same thing, whether they're both going up or they're both going down. How do I know if they're up or down? Well, my leading coefficient is positive. The leading coefficient here is a positive one. That means both ends are going up. So the limit as x goes towards infinity and the limit as x goes towards negative infinity are both positive infinity. Now, this particular question only asks to find the limit as x goes decreasing as x goes towards negative infinity, but they're both positive infinity regardless. So there's my answer, positive infinity, written nice and neat in interval notation. Or not interval notation, excuse me, limit notation. All right, now for part C. Part C also has two parts. Use the table values of f of x to determine if f is best modeled by a linear, quadratic, exponential, or logarithmic function. Give reasons for your answer based on the relationship between the change in the output values of f and the change of the input values of f. Now, as long as your input values are consecutive and equal in length. So I'm going up 1 to 2, up 1 to 3, up 1 to 4, up 1 to 5. So my input values are consecutive and they're equal in length. It makes this really easy to determine what type of function I have. Now, linear functions increase or decrease at a constant rate. Exponent, or excuse me, quadratic functions, the second difference is increasing at a constant rate. So the, the change of my change is linear, if that makes sense. Hopefully you learned that in class. Exponential functions, we see that the y values or my outputs are multiplying repeatedly. They're proportional to each other. In logarithmic, the inputs are proportional. The outputs are not. So let's take a look at this and determine what we think is happening here. So the first thing I'm going to do is look at my change. From here to here, I'm going up 5. From here to here, I'm going up 9. From 4 to 17, I'm going up, well, 17 minus 4, if we can figure that out, up 13. And then I'm going up 17 from third, uh, 17 to 34. Okay, so I'm obviously not linear because linear is where you have a constant rate of change. Up 5, up 5, up 5, up 5, up 5, something along those lines. Okay, now let's check my second difference. What's happening to my change? Well, I'm going 
up 4, 5 to 9, up 4, 9 to 13, up 4, 13 to 17. So here, my rate of change, my second difference, the change of my change is linear. That's the sign of a quadratic function. So here's my write-up. So part A is that this is, or part one of part C, is that I'm identifying that I'm officially saying that this could best be modeled with a quadratic function. And now I've got to give my reason for part two, because the second difference in the output values are a constant four over consecutive equal length input value intervals. Saying about the consecutive equal length input value intervals is actually really important, because if you don't have that, you actually can't make that decision. And this is best model with a quadratic model. All right, that's it for multiple, or not multiple choice, excuse me, free response question number one. Again, is your question on the AP test this year going to look like this? Well, yes and no. It's going to have different functions. It might have a different table, different G or different H, but it's going to be the same setup. You're given some functions, table form, graph form, analytical form, and you're going to be asked some questions about them, solving them, setting them equal to a specific value, looking for zeros, something along those lines like we were just asked here. So practice problems just like this, and you will be ready for question number one.